Okay, we're back from our break, and now we're going to look at our second lecture tonight, um, Tang and Song China. And uh, we're going to really look at, now we're beginning to connect these cultures together. We were connecting them a little bit together when we looked at Chinese and Indian culture meeting together in Southeast Asia. Now we're going to make even more connections of one culture to another as we look at the development of Tang and Song China and hooking up with these other cultures. Uh, ideas spread along the trade routes and uh, now we're seeing the constructing of trade routes really for the first time. We looked at the Bay of Bengal and the, sp and the spreading of uh, a lot of the ideas of Southeast Asia and India and China all intermingling. For example, pork was domesticated in Southeast Asia for the first time. And in Southeast Asia, because of the interesting climate and the, and the, the lay of the land, the way that everything was part of an island or, for, or tropical forest, there were no herd animals. We have no horses. We have no, no cattle in Southeast Asia. And the diet that they're mostly uh, using in that area is a fish diet. But pigs were uh, the meat animal that they developed in Southeast Asia. Now, I mentioned to you before this article in the New York Times uh, with the, with the um, discovery of all of these sea trade routes from the earliest times of Asia and uh, of Egypt and Mesopotamia, that the sea trade routes were as important as the Silk Road or the land routes connecting Europe and Asia. Pigs spread to Egypt very early. And in Egypt, they were considered sacred to set in Egypt and they were not eaten. And pigs also in um, the uh, Mesopotamian and Egyptian world were taboo to Jews and later they were taboo to Muslims. Um, but this is an example of one of the, one of the um, uh, elements, one of the cultural ideas that was spread along the trade routes. Another example is money. The coining of money first began in Lydia, which was a semi-Greek kingdom in Anatolia, Anatolia or Asia Minor in the first millennium BC. Uh, the way that the Greeks coined money was to take a hard metal and put a design in it and stamp it into the soft metal of gold or silver. In other words, you take a mold and you sort of pound it into the, into the gold or silver and make an impression on the coin. Uh, the, this kind of coinage spread to Europe and North Africa and India. But the Chinese developed the coining of money independently from the, uh, from the Mediterranean world. And the Chinese made coins by pouring molten metal into a mold. And so they had the same idea of coining. It just took a different form. Buddhism also spread along the trade routes in an organized way. And here is this map. I knew I had this map somewhere here. But you can see the sea routes that go along the Red Sea and, and, and along Arabia and, and um, across the um, Indian Ocean and the Bay of Bengal. And you can see those sea routes, which were just as important as the Silk Road. And, and you can see the Silk Road up above that crosses from China all the way into um, uh, Central Asia and finally hooking up with the Roman Empire. Uh, the label on this map says medieval trade routes, but really they existed from ancient times. Uh, they were more developed in medieval times, but uh, the, mo uh, the more archaeological digs are made, the more ancient all of these things are turning out to be. They're older than we used to think they are. The spread of Buddhism happened in an organized way along these trade routes as well. And Buddhism, in fact, grew to become one of the three world religions. Like Christianity and Islam, Buddhism was not associated with a specific ethnic or kinship group. And like Christianity and Islam, Buddhism was adaptable wherever it went and became 
almost nativized or localized in each of the cultures that Buddhism spread to. Um, only rarely was it actually spread by a king or leader, and we saw one example of a king adopting Buddhism. When Remember when King Ashoka, the Mayan ruler of India, supported it and sent missionaries to Tibet and tried to spread Buddhism through his, um, through his edicts out of a guilt of conscience for killing so many people. King Kanishka of the Kushans in, in the area of modern Afghanistan also adopted Buddhism and tried to spread it among his followers. But primarily, monks and missionaries and pilgrims were the ones who spread Buddhism throughout the ancient Eurasian world. Mostly these monks followed the Silk Road or the Indian Ocean trade routes to Southeast Asia and China, Korea and Japan, although a lot of them went westward too and into the Mediterranean world. The Chinese pilgrims Faxian and um, uh, Xuanzang uh, in the 5th and 7th centuries AD describe these Buddhist pilgrims going along the trade routes. Missionaries also traveled to Syria and Egypt and Macedonia and Sri Lanka as well. And other monks traveled to Burma and Thailand and Sumatra. Okay. And here you can see on this map the spread of Buddhism in all the countries that became Buddhist. Um, and, and I've drawn some arrows to show uh, where Buddhism spread. I should have drawn more arrows than that. But the arrows that go to the west are where the missionaries went but they didn't actually convert all the countries and the colored countries are the ones that are converted. Um, They include China, um, Southeast Asia, uh, Srivijaya is the orange there, India, um, the pink is, uh, well, is more of a purple, uh, Afghanistan and Tibet and Nepal and Japan and Korea. All of these areas became Buddhist countries. And here is the the India of Ashoka, and those little dots are his pillars that he erected um, telling about Buddhism. Okay, and here are the trade routes that is spread along. Theravada Buddhism, or the teaching of the elders, was centered in Sri Lanka. And the Theravada Buddhism was closer to Buddha's earliest teachings. And so the goal was nirvana, the absence of suffering and the end of the rebirth cycle. And nirvana was available only to monks. There was a belief that the material world was the root of suffering, that the material world was the cause of all suffering. Now, this is the... this is. You might almost call this a fundamentalist type of Buddhism, a very basic form of the Buddhism that Buddha taught. Mahayana Buddhism was called the great vehicle. Uh, Theravada Buddhism here is the lesser vehicle. And Mahayana Buddhism is the great vehicle. Uh, And it very creatively... Uh, adopted a new tradition of bodhisattvas. And a bodhisattva was a being striving for enlightenment. All Buddhists could aspire to become a bodhisattva. And the bodhisattva, however, did not seek to escape the world, but rather was active in the world. So the bodhisattva, who, who it means Buddha-like, bodhisattva means Buddha-like, who has attained the enlightenment of Buddha, But the Bodhisattva expresses compassion for others and tries to relieve suffering and they see it as more important than nirvana. So what this means is action in the world and relieving the suffering of the world was more important to to Mahayana Buddhism than, than rather selfishly just escaping for your own pleasure, you know, escaping the torment of the world, I guess you would call it. Um, But they also saw the material world as a source of suffering. But bodhisattvas postponed nirvana to help others achieve enlightenment. And they encouraged the translation of the Buddhist scriptures. Okay. 
Faith in bodhisattvas resulted in many local gods and goddesses becoming Buddhist saints because they were interpreted, the local gods and goddesses were interpreted as bodhisattvas. And in this way, Buddhism could become integrated with a lot of local cultures and become uh, part of the local culture. Um, Also, as the um, Mahayana Buddhism spread, it included the folkloric religious practices outside of the Buddhist scriptures and the local practices were incorporated into a local kind of Buddhism. This is called religious syncretism, the blending together of a lot of different traditions. And these uh, syncretic tendencies made it attractive to many and varied people. And it was during the Han Empire, what we might call uh, the peace of the Han Empire, that Buddhism spread so broadly and so widely throughout the known world, or, or the known world to them. Here is a Thai Buddha, and so you can see the, the um, incorporation of Thai tradition into the tradition of Buddha. And here is a bodhisattva. Uh, these bodhisattvas I'm showing you are uh, pictures from Nepal. Uh, these are Nepalese bodhisattvas. There's a man and here's a woman. Women could also be bodhisattvas in the, um, in, in the Nepalese tradition, at least, and in, in a lot of the other traditions. Uh, and women were, women were accorded a, a equality in Buddhism, and this was attractive, of course, to the Thais and the Vietnamese uh, in Southeast Asia because they accorded women more um, equality than the Chinese did, for example. And here is the Han Empire at its greatest height. I might have made it a little bit bigger than that. It probably should have been bigger than that. Um, But here we see it um, spreading throughout the area of the modern Chinese Empire. And here we have a close-up of the Han Empire. Okay. We talked last time about the Han Empire being sort of like the Roman Empire in some ways. Well, at least it was an empire. Uh, It was like Rome in another way, and this is that it had three heirs. And when we talk about Rome next week, and and when the Roman Empire breaks up, we're going to see that there were three successor states to Rome. Well, there were three successor states to the Han Empire as well. And those three uh, successor states were the Tang Empire, Tibet, and the Uyghur Empire. Okay. But not before a period of chaos and turmoil. And, and after the Han Empire broke up, there were three kingdoms, and that's called the Three Kingdoms period. The three kings actually became three gods. And then after a period of chaos and disorder, the empire started to come back together again. And first it was reunified under the Sui and the Tang. And it was reunified in 618 A.D., uh, briefly, uh, in the same area that we saw the beginning of the Chinese culture, in the area of Chang'an in the Wei River Valley. Okay, and along the Grand Canal linking the Yellow and the Yangtze Rivers. The Grand Canal was the great achievement of the Han Empire. The Sui Empire pulled it together very briefly and it lasted only 40 years. It was the Tang Empire that really made the great achievements of recreating the Han Empire or recreating the Chinese Empire. In 618 AD, the Tang Empire was pulled together again by the brilliant emperor Li Ximin, 627 to 649 AD. And what he did was avoid the problem of over-centralization, which was a big problem for the Han Empire. Uh, Xi Ximin allowed power to the local nobles. He let the locals have more control over their local area, the nobles, the gentry, and the officials, and the religious establishments. So he let people have more local control. And what we see happening in the... Uh, Tang Empire is the blending together of Confucianism with Buddhism and with a third element. And the third element is the culture of the nomadic Turkic uh, nomad culture. 
And we've already seen, we've already seen a, a beginning of this nomadic culture infusing itself into China. Now we see another infusion of this Turkic culture with the, um, with the Turks who are called the Khan, uh, and, and the leader to legitimate power. Okay. The descendants of these Turkic elites of the small kingdoms of North China intermarried with Chinese officials and settlers, and China at this time became heavily influenced by um, Central Asian powers, okay, um, by Central Asian culture. And as you can see on this map, um, this is Tang, China, and it's kind of hooked together. Um, it, it's more central and far more Western than traditional China, but it links traditional China with the nomadic West, and then Tang China is surrounded by um, nomadic tribes to the north, the Uyghurs and the uh, and the Western Turks and the Khitan, which are Turkic nomads surrounding the Tang Empire. But the Tang Empire itself is infused with this nomadic culture. Um, it blended together in the Wei River Valley, and you can see Chang'an is the capital on that map. It's right there in the Wei River Valley, which is the center of Chinese culture from the very beginning, and we see repeated reincarnations of China through the Wei River Valley. And the Wei River Valley is at the very end of the Silk Road. Um, which began the routes to South China, to Canton, and the routes westward. Chang'an was a huge city, the center of a market network and the political capital, and it's the center of a system of roads that now extended far westward, ever farther westward, and all over China. Well, Buddhism affected the Tang Empire in very extreme ways because and, and here we can see, um, let's look at a close-up of this map. Here you can see the Tang Empire, which is kind of divided. Tibet actually remains separate. And there's Chang'an at the corner of the Wei River Valley, and Canton, which is hooked together um, by trade routes. Um, Canton in the south, hooking it all together. All right. The descendants of Turkic elites of the small kingdoms of northern China intermarried with Chinese officials. We've already gone through this. Canton was a huge city, the center of a market network and a political capital, and everything was linked together by a system of roads. All right. Uh, here is the crossbow, by the way. Um, let's go back to this. Buddhism set forth a religious function for kings and emperors to bring humankind into Buddhism. And this was the goal that Buddhism taught to kings, that the king's role was to convert his subjects and to care for his subjects. Protective spirits would aid the king in governing the state and the people. And state cults of Buddhism developed in Central Asia and North China. The Tang inherited this idea, and later it spread also to Korea and Japan. Um, the crossbow is one of the elements of these um, of the barbarian tribes, the nomadic tribes. Okay. Okay. The Tang inherited the idea of the religious function for kings and emperors. To, to be almost a shepherd or a father fig figure to bring humankind into Buddhism. Okay. Mahayana Buddhism predominated, and it became an important ally of the Tang emperors. But in 840 AD, the state moved to crush it. Okay. Why, if Buddhism was so crucial and so central to the Tang dynasty, did the state eventually decide that Buddhism had to go? Largely because of the Buddhist monks who founded monasteries all over the kingdom and became economically extremely powerful. Uh, so that the monks then became centers of commerce, they collected a lot of money, 
and uh, they uh, represented a, a resource that the state could not use. It's almost a rival power to the state. And also because the Buddhists felt that they had a duty to influence the king, and therefore the Buddhist monks interfered with state politics. They felt that they had the right to advise the kings. Also, these monasteries, uh, these monasteries were tax-exempt, so that they were able to collect their wealth and um, not pay the state. This decreased the revenues of the state. But most importantly was the decline of the family in China because if you have monks and nuns going into monasteries, they're not having children, and so the population is declining. And then the family, the, the strength of the family declines as the monastery becomes more important. By the ninth century, hundreds of thousands had entered monasteries and this deprived their families of their labor and so that the the um, uh, families were losing uh, labor producing members to the monasteries and also if they if they were entering monasteries and not having children this denied descendants to their ancestors and this offended Confucianists because Confucianists needed the um, links with their ancestors to hold the family together over the generations. Um, Buddhism was opposed to the Confucian idea of the family as the model of the state. It had a very different idea of what was the model of the ruler and what was the state. In 690, Wu Zhou, a woman, seized control of the government and declared herself a female emperor by claiming that she was a bodhisattva. Okay, She favored Buddhists and Taoists over Confucianism. And indeed, in the Tang dynasty, women were very free and equal in Tang China, and they were very opposed by Confucianists. Um, you know, we're going to see why women are free and equal. Um, this may seem very strange in a moment, but it, it, it's because they come from these Turkic nomadic tribes. And we're going to look at the Turkic tribes uh, when we look at the Mongols. We'll see what these characteristics are like. But one of the hallmarks of it is that women are free and equal in these nomadic tribes. Um, but we'll get back to that later uh, because of their Turkish nomadic roots. And the Confucianists were against this freedom for women. Okay, And here is a woman bodhisattva, which I put in there to show what this woman was claiming that she was when she took over the Chinese state, which is very interesting. Well, the Tang Empire extended well to the west into Central Asia, as we saw on our map, that it went, it, it, it extended far much uh, farther into the West than ever the Chinese Empire had before. And there it came in contact with European culture. It uh, came in contact with the legacy of Alexander the Great in 323 BC and Greek culture, which had taken up residence, you might say, in that area that is modern Afghanistan, uh, in that area that links together the East and the West. And one of the things that Alexander the Great did was build a whole bunch of Alexandrias. And he named the, these all these cities Alexandria in all the places that he conquered. Those names survive in the modern uh, Middle Eastern names of the cities of Samarkand and Gandhara. And those are both... Um, uh, variations of the word Alexander, and so uh, and so Samarkand and Gandhara were originally cities that were named Alexandria. And in these in this region where uh, Greek culture came, we say appearing in the culture stone bas reliefs and full figure statuary on the Greek model that first became characteristic of Indian art and also became characteristic of the art in this Central Asian region, along with Alexander's. Uh, empire and culture came Hellenic knowledge of mathematics, astronomy, and physiology that was brought to Central Asia and Tibet, and it's along the Silk Road and the um, and the ocean trading routes across the Bay of Bengal and the um, and the Indian Ocean that they spread into Asia uh, in the same way that um, that this knowledge spread along with Islam, but it preceded Islam. This happened with the Greeks. 
first of all. Okay, here is Alexander's empire, if you can recall. And you see the very eastern part of Alexander's empire that's labeled Bactria and, and, and touches the border of India. This is the region that we're talking about that becomes the linking together of the east with the west. And here we see um, the, the region that we're talking about here that's marked in yellow. Okay. And uh, modern Turkestan. Okay. That's the region where these Alexandrian cities are. It's, it's where modern Afghanistan is, if you can see where Afghanistan is in that map. Okay, and so this is the region that hooks together with the Tang Empire. Okay. I put these in, uh, these are Chinese. Uh, they're in the wrong order, but they're such wonderful, charming pictures. I just put them in the wrong place. Okay. This is representing Chinese culture, and to me, it, it has this element of westernized and Turkic culture these particular drawings. Okay, the Romance of Alexander was uh, uh, first written in Greek in Egypt and it spread to Asia in translation. In fact, the Mongolian version of the Romance of Alexander reached China and Korea by the 1300s. Uh, the fortunes of the Tang Empire were related to the development of Turkic power from Siberia to Iran and so it's the spread of Turkic power that really spreads all of this culture and hooks together Eastern culture and Western culture along the trade routes. And this is the original homeland of the Turks to the north and east of China in modern Mongolia and they spread westward. Okay, and this is the homeland it, within that pink circle is the original homeland of the Turks and then they spread to the westward and to the south of them is Song China which we'll get to in a moment. Okay, but w right now we're going to talk about the Uyghurs who were the Turks who spread um, and uh, were the second heir of the Roman Empire, of, of the Han Empire. The second heir of Han China was the Uyghur Empire. After the fall of, of the Han Empire in around 220 AD, the Turkic populations began moving westward through Mongolia to Central Asia and eventually to Anatolia. So they start a great migration as the Chinese Empire fell. We see a fracturing of this Turkic power by internal warfare and that allowed the Tang Empire to spread westward. So the Tang Empire is spread westward largely because the Turks were not able to unify themselves, but also because they incorporated a lot of the Turk culture into their culture. Within 50 years, though, a new Turkic order arose, and these are called the Uyghurs. They included the great cities of Bukhara, Samarkand, Tashkent, and all were on the caravan routes that linked the East together with the West. The Uyghurs had a literate culture with strong ties to both the Middle East and China and they hooked together all of that culture. Okay, here is uh, Song China, which we're going to see later. And um, hmm, I must have put that in the wrong place. All right. Let's see. There's the Tang Empire moving to the west. Here's where the, the, the move, the, um, maybe we'll go back to that. The Uyghurs start out in the north and then they move, then they move to the west. And this is the area of the Uyghur Empire right here, this yellow area. Uh, okay. They had a literate culture with strong ties to both the Middle East and China, and you can see they linked together China and the Middle East. The Uyghurs were famous as merchants and as professional scribes and translators of many languages so that they linked together with their languages both the East and the West. First, they used a simple script. Okay, here we see the Uyghurs. I will get a close-up of the Uyghurs. And this is the this is what the land looks like in that region of Bakara uh, and um, Afghanistan is that area. They were famous merchants and professional scribes, translators of many languages. Um, first, they used a simple script, 
and uh, the Sogdians were related to the Persians introduced a syllabic script called Semitic, Semitic Syriac and this new script made possible several innovations for one thing they changed from a tax paid in kind to a money tax and so it's much easier though those of you who are mathematicians or economists know that it's easier to count money than it is to count goods right so that you can find the value in money in a, in a lot easier ways than you can in counting goods paid in kind. And also, they began the minting of coins, and this makes commerce a lot easier. And urban culture in this region of modern Afghanistan um, embraced the Buddhist classics, and the religious art was based on the styles of northern India that was very Hellenized and a Greek kind of art. Clothing, tools, and architecture were a mixture of East Asian and Middle Eastern. By the mid-9th century, the Uyghur power was in eclipse, but Uyghur culture continued to influence the urban life in the region, and in fact, buried hordes in caves discovered in the 19th century revealed predominantly Buddhist culture with strong Greek and Persian influences. Okay, here's a golden Doric. Uh, a coin from this uh, this Uyghur Empire um, from the British Museum. Okay. In the mid 19th century, ninth century, the Uyghur power was in eclipse, but it continued to influence urban life in the region. After the Tang Empire reunited Central Asia with China in the seventh century, China was greatly affected by Central Asia. Uh, China vividly uh, reflected this Central Asian, Asian Uyghur culture. One of the things that happened to China was that people stopped wearing robes, and instead of robes, they abandoned pants. Okay. Now, the pants were invented by the Turks because they're nomads and they ride horses. And have you ever tried to ride a horse in a robe? It's not comfortable. <laughs> so pants are an invention of nomadic horse riders. And, and so this was adopted by all of the Chinese culture. This also happened in the Roman Empire in the, six, in the third century AD that the Romans actually adopted um, nomad, the, the pants of the German nomads. Um, also in the Chinese Empire, cotton replaced hemp for clothing. And polo was now a sport. And again, this is Turkic. The Turks rode horses, and then they they, they played polo on their horses. Uh, women played this game too. Women were now a, polo was now a sport, and women played polo, and women rose to equality within the uh, Tang Empire. And this was a direct influence of the um, uh, of the Turkic culture. Music changed. Stringed instruments were introduced at this time. And also grape wine and tea became part of the uh, Tang culture. The Turkish people also transmitted Chinese culture to the West. And among the things that they transmitted to the West were paper making, woodblock printing, iron working, ceramics, crossbows, and gunpowder. And so all of this moved along the trade routes. Okay, and here's the list. Um, after the Tang Empire, uh, there was localism and specialization. The Tang Empire broke down rather quickly into, into a number of successor states in the Tang Empire. And these included the Minyak Empire, which was Tibetan, and the Tangut Empire, the Lao Empire, which is the Khitan and Mongol people, and the Song Empire, which uh, was a result of pure Chinese. Okay, here here are some. Here is a uh, representative of the blending together of cultures in uh, the um, Tang Empire: the Confucian culture, uh, the warrior culture, and the Buddhist culture. And here are the here are the various kingdoms that the Tang Empire broke down into. Okay. Uh, I've got a chart at the bottom that shows what these are. 
Uh, the Lao Empire is the northern uh, pink empire, and Song China is green, Tibet is purple, and the orange is the Xi Xia Empire. Okay, so we see the breakdown into more local empires. Song China represents, I guess, what we would call real China because the other kingdoms were actually Turkic and Mongol, except for Tibet, which was which was its, its own separate culture. But the other two, the uh, Xi and and the um, Lao Empire, are Turkic. China, more or less condensed, and you know this reminds me of the way the Roman Empire. Um, it didn't fall. I, you, you know, we can't, it's so common to say, well, the Roman Empire fell, but it didn't fall. What it did was shrink. It, it shrunk up to its eastern, uh, eastern core. And this is what happened in China, too. It shrunk up to its eastern core, but when it did that, it abandoned its homeland. And this is the exact thing that happened to Rome. Uh, China, in this green part, shrunk up, but it shrunk to the south into a different location. Just like the Roman Empire shrunk up into its eastern component, which was the Byzantine Empire. This is not the fall of an empire. It's the relocation of the empire into a different kind of core. It, it, it's, it's a kind of a new creation in a way, or a rebirth of that culture. Song China represented the return to basic Chinese concepts, and what it did was to reject all of that strong Turkic influence, that strong um, um, nomadic influence in the culture. In 907, the last Tang emperor was forced to resign, and in 960, uh, Zhao Kuang Yin, a military commander, took over and reunited China under a single dynasty. He was honest and able of the, last, uh, of the last five dynasties that had struggled to control North China. He was a fearless warrior and a man of scholarly leanings who collected books when on campaign, and the troops proclaimed him emperor. Um, he renamed, they renamed the emperor Tai Zhu, and rooted all his rivals, and this founded the Song Dynasty. Okay. The one rival Taizu faced was the Northern Liao Dynasty, founded in 907 by the Manchu Kitan people, which were again these Turkic nomadic people. The failure uh, um, set a precedent for weakness in dealing with the nomadic peoples of the north. So Taizu was not able to control those northerners. He had to make a diplomatic treaty with them and tolerate them on his border. This presaged the 13th century destruction of China by the Mongols. From 1004 on, the Song were forced to sign a series of humiliating treaties with the Kitans and paid heavy tribute, tribute to deter it from raiding uh, the Chinese um, uh, kingdom. And, or, or empire, if you want to call it empire, and and the uh, Kitans are this pink area to the north, and uh, they threatened the Chinese, which is the green area on that northern border, and and having to having to tolerate them rather than conquer them, um, forced them to to treat with barbarian peoples on all their borders. This is another similarity with the Byzantine Empire, because the Byzantines too had to tolerate invaders from the north and had to make treaties with them rather than conquering them. Okay. The, from 1004 on, um, the Song were forced to sign a series of humiliating treaties with the Kitans and paid heavy tribute to deter the Kitans from raiding them. Song China was now essentially limited to the south. They were no longer able to control the vast area they had controlled before, and now they were confined to a southern area. They were military. Okay, and here you can see them on the map, the green part. They're confined to the southern area. They were limited to the south. The military closely subordinated 
uh, was subordinated to the civilian administrators of scholar gentry class. And this was Confucianism. Confucianism rose to the surface again. Buddhism is fading away. It's still there. But Confucianism is now the, the ancient Chinese tradition is becoming the, um, the predominant one. Only civil administrators were allowed to be governors, and all military commanders were rotated to prevent them from building up a power base. So until now, we see the military fading in power, and the scholar, the gentry scholar uh, class is now rising to the surface. This is the Confucian class that's educated by the Confucian culture. The Song, Song rulers strongly promoted the interests of Confucian scholar gentry, class, and this was the key bulwark against the revival of warlordism. Salaries of this class were significantly increased, and they were given many perks. The civil exams, which were part of the Confucian culture, were now routinized, and they were standardized. Now they were given every three years at three levels, and so the Confucian civil exams were given in the districts, and then another level was the provincial uh, level, and then finally the imperial level. And so passing these exams would allow you to rise through the government at these different levels. The ascendancy of the scholar gentry over the aristocrats and the Buddhists was now fully secured. So we see the reemergence of Confucianism taking over the government, and with that came the revival of Confucian thought. Okay. Now at this time, um, we see new academies founded, many texts and inscriptions recovered from the old Confucian ca uh, past and incorporated into the new academies and the schools. Impressive libraries were established. They were saved up. This knowledge was gathered and um, uh, put together. New schools of philosophy argued the different interpretations of Confucianism, and others argued the merits of Confucianism and Taoism over Buddhism. So we have this conflict of ideas with Confucianism um, uh, winning out over all of them. Okay. Ju uh, Shi stressed the importance of applying philosophical principles to everyday life and Neo-Confucianists cultivated personal morality as the highest human goal. They argued that virtue could be attained by study, books, and observation, and superior men fit to govern and teach others could be developed through study and training. And so the goal became to mold good citizens by training them in the good habits of Confucianism um, to be personally moral and responsible govern governors. Neo-Confucianist thought had a great influence on following um, eras of Chinese culture. Okay, But because they returned to the Confucianism of the past and they revived Confucianism in, in, a, in a rather uniform way, this emphasis on tradition and past precedents stifled innovation and critical thinking. They were very backward looking. They looked at the past as the model for what they wanted to achieve, not looking to the future for new ways of thinking about it. They, but they saw the past as the model to try to achieve again, to go back to that past model. Uh, the emphasis on rank uh, deference and ritual reinforced class, age, and gender distinctions. And so we have almost a, it's not as strong as the Indian caste system, but we have a freezing of people in their roles and in their traditional definitions of those roles. Patriarchy, for example, was reinforced. The power of the father, the male head of the household, who is compared to the emperor as the ruler of the family. And what is stressed in Confucianism is people keeping their place, which results in social harmony and prosperity. And if you go back and read your Confucian writings and the Neo-Confucianist writings that you have for tonight, you will see this, this emphasis on following these role models, conforming to this, these models to keep the harmony in society. 
historical experience and the past were touted as the best guide for the future. So what do we want to do in the future? We want to be like we were in the past. And this makes this Neo-Confucianism backward-looking. Okay. Um, we can compare that to Christian Europe, which I don't think I mentioned when I gave the lecture, but um, one of the big changes that takes place in the Roman Empire when, when St. Augustine writes his great work, The City of God, to redefine Roman culture as Christian culture, one of the key elements in it is to see history as a progression toward the city of God, the progression toward a better future. And so so Christian Europe is forward-looking. Uh, and so the comparison is that China, the, the Song China, looks to the past for its models and Christian Europe looks to the future. Well, we'll come back to that later when we look at Christian Europe. These ideas were forcefully imposed on the South as they moved southward. Okay, South China uh, became more and more wedded to and, and reinforcing of Chinese tradition and making that stronger. Well, again, did it decline? Uh, uh, this is a historical problem. Can we talk about anything declining? Uh, certainly Song China transformed into something else. What happened was Kitan treaties encouraged other nomadic peoples to carve out territories, and Song China became weaker as the barbarians, the Turkic tribesmen outside of uh, outside of the uh, uh, Song Empire, became stronger in relation to it. Um, the Tibetan tribesmen, the Tanga tribesmen from Tibet, established a kingdom named Shi Shia, northeast of uh, Liao. And um, I think Liao is to the northeast. Uh, and the Song uh, Chinese had to pay tribute to the barbarian tribes surrounding them. And the protection tribute was a great drain on the empire, along with the cost of an army of one million. The most able men went into the administration rather than the army, so a weak army was uh, was a result in the Song Empire. And here we can see um, the Shijia Empire um, and the Southern Song and the, um, the the Jia Empire to the north, which is the pink. Uh, this is a revival of the Turkic elements and uh, forcing China ever southward. Okay. Fortifications often were not repaired. The army was weakened. Fortifications were not repaired. And the money went into culture rather than defense of the empire. Among the ruling classes, painting and poetry were cultivated. Um, uh, the most splendid achievements of the Song era. And in the 1070s and 1080s, Wang and Shi, the chief minister of the Song Sheng Song Empire, attempted reform and failed. There was peasant unrest, banditry, and rebellion throughout the kingdom, and the military were unprepared to take charge of it. In 1115, the Jerkins, who were nomads in the north, overthrew the Lao kingdom of the Kitans and established the Qin kingdom north of the Song. The songs were limited to the Yangtze River and southward, and the southern song lasted from 1127 to 1279. Okay. And here we see again the kingdom to the north, um, the Jurchens forcing the song ever southward into the region which wasn't the origin of China. Okay. The Southern Song lasted from 1127 to 1279. The Tang and Song eras accomplished much in science and technology, liter literature, and fine arts. They did make a lot of advances. They invented banks, for example. Paper money was the invention of the Chinese that later spread to Europe. 
The Grand Canal was a great achievement. The dikes and the dams, well, those had been in China since the very beginning of Chinese culture. They were, they were um, a hallmark of, of the building of Chinese culture. Bridges, explosive powder, compasses. The first kite belongs to the Song Empire, although they might have gotten it from the Malays. We're not sure. Uh, they imported chairs from India. They learned how to make chairs. Uh, the abacus was a, a great achievement in their culture. They were printing with movable type, and they invented paper. The Confucian scholar Gentry, Gentry replaced the Buddhists and emphasized art and literature. There was a growing fixation on daily life and the delights of the natural world. Short stories lauded the common folk. In a way, the Song Empire put culture above military protection. Can we learn anything from them? I don't know. It sounds like they had some good values. So here I'm going to show you just a few of the traditional Chinese arts. Here's a very naturalistic embroidery. I'm sorry, I couldn't get a smoother picture of that. And here are some little, these are chopstick wrists that show little uh, Chinese boys as chopstick wrists and the naturalistic art. And this is, again, naturalistic art. This is a dragon. Not naturalistic, not realistic, but a dragon is part of Chinese culture. And this, uh, again, is um, very characteristic of Chinese art, these protective dogs or lions. And the horses of the, uh, of the nomads. And these beautiful realistic figures, again, traditional Chinese art rising to the forefront. Okay. So this is the Song Empire. Um, we're not through with China yet. We're, we're having an empire after empire repeatedly in China. Uh, we're, we're, China is going to revive yet again in the Ming Empire before our period is over. And we'll talk about it again as, as we look at the Mongols, who, who are more of these northern nomadic Turkic people, who uh, invade China and actually conquer it. But first, we're going, to, um, we're going to go back to Europe next week, and we're going to look at the parallel development after Rome fell or declined or disappeared, whatever you want to say, what happened to Rome. As I said, there were three heirs to Han China. There were three heirs to the Roman Empire, and that's what we're going to look at next week, the heirs of the Roman Empire. Okay, okay. Well, uh, we will talk about uh, Genghis Khan and the Mongol Empire uh, and, and the Ming Dynasty, but we'll come to that later. Okay, um, let's stop for tonight, and we'll continue next week. Uh, Maria, uh, Maria, do you want to give them back this?